Good morning, church. It is really good to see everyone here this morning. If you uh, came this morning hoping to see David Ray preach a sermon, I have good news and bad news for you. <laughs> David Ray is going to preach today, but not the David Ray that you thought was going to preach. Uh, we're thinking about getting Dad to preach next week and really throw a wrench into this whole thing. <laughs> it's, it's a blast, actually, to travel with the three of us because, you know, as you're getting on a plane, they say, what's your name? Well, I'm David Ray. What's your name? I'm David Ray. What's your name? I'm David Ray. TSA agents do not have a sense of humor. <laughs> they do not. But we have a few of us that are missing this morning. Uh, David is the keynote speaker, speaker for the Sozo event. And that's a, a youth event that uh, Dustin and Anthony and actually Haas Ridgeway from the Morgantown Church kind of put together. They are away and they have about 50 kids so it's a very cool event, both uh, young men and young women that they're, they're working through. Sozo means to restore or to, uh, to save. So that's what they're talking about this weekend. As we uh, begin today, we are going to be talking about great. I've entitled my lesson, Great Sermon, because I want everyone, when you leave the building today, to say, man, Charlie did a great sermon this morning, didn't he? <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer. <laughs> Holy Father, you are incredible, and we thank you so much for the things you do for us. Father, we realize that we have much by your hand. As a people, Father, we, we lift you up and we praise you. Father, we pray this morning that we are able to uh, glean the wisdom from your word, that we're able to look into it and find what it truly means to be great in your kingdom. Father, we pray that you be with the speaker today. Calm his nerves, allow him to uh, speak your word well. Father, I pray that you would fill me with the spirit and allow it to flow through me and just penetrate the lives that need to be touched today. Father, it's in your son's name that we pray, amen. Joe, you are a great elder. Man, I appreciate you so very much, just serving with you. It's, it's just a pleasure for me to serve with you. And Connie, those cookies you made Wednesday night, they were the best monster cookies I think I've eaten in my entire life. No offense, Mom. They, they were really, really, really good. And Bill, you, the story that I heard from David, my goodness, this is the most interesting man in the world right here. I'm telling you. And Jim... I really appreciate what you do with the ball team. That is awesome. That's really cool. And, and Kim with the, the CIS program, I mean, it is really great. And you know what, Mom and Dad? You are the greatest parents that a guy, you are the best parents I have. <laughs> I think we as a group have a tendency to want to be great. We want to be acknowledged for the things that we do, which is okay. But I think in the text this morning, we see a problem that arises with James and John and Jesus in their idea of what it means to be great. As we begin, I think we should set the stage for the text that we just read. In verse 33, Jesus is communicating to his disciples about what is going to happen. He wants to tell those that are closest to him that something very bad is about to happen. Zach, can you throw that verse up? He says, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him but three days later he will rise. Can you imagine having that playing out in your head? I mean, think about it. Jesus knew full well, this is well over a week in advance of what is going to transpire in Jerusalem, but he still moves forward. But it must be weighing upon his mind because he wants to tell those around him, those closest to him, what is going to happen? 
hey guys, this is going to be a bad time. I'm, I'm, I'm not looking forward to this. They're going to mock me and spit on me and beat me and hang me on a cross. And what do the two say? Those that are closest to him. Jesus, after pouring out his heart, his closest friends respond. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, now remember, Jesus just said this. And then James and John come to talk to Jesus. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. We have a favor. We have a favor. Now, guys, you know what that means, right? When your wife comes to you and said, honey, I have a favor I want to ask for you. You know something's coming, right? I mean, when your kids come to you and they say, mom and dad, I really have a favor. It's going to be a zinger. They say, well, Jesus responds, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, Let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at the left when you come into your glory. Let us be great. Let us be on your right hand and our left hand. And naturally Jesus says, man, you don't know what you are asking. Remember, guys, I just told you what's about to happen. In about a week, they're going to hang me at a cross. And you want to be on my right hand? And on my left hand, you really want to be where those robbers are going to be? Can you see this playing out in Jesus? You don't know what you're asking of me. You don't realize what you are requesting. But they, of course, say, oh, yes, I can do that. We still want this favor, Jesus. Of course, now when the other ten... They hear this. They get ticked off. They get indignant with James and John. Rightfully so, right? I mean, come on. How can they possibly ask Jesus for this favor when he has just shared with them what is going on? They should be ticked off, right? But unfortunately, they're not ticked off for the right reasons. If you look over in... uh, Verse 33 of chapter 9, we see an earlier story of what transpired at one other point in time. When they came to Capernaum, when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you guys arguing about on the road? What were you guys arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So it wasn't that they were upset with James and John because they asked a favor of Jesus when he was pouring his heart out. They were upset with James and John because we didn't think of it first. We want to be great too. We just want to be great. See, they still didn't get it. I think sometimes we have a tendency to not know what is great. And there was definite disconnect between what the apostles thought and what Jesus thought was great. So I think at this point in our discussion, we need to ask the question, what does it mean to be great? I mean, really and truly, what does it mean to be great? Maybe... This depicts your idea of what it means to be great. The great white shark symbolizes power and dominance. I mean, we're talking top of the food chain here. But there's a problem with power. Bishop Crichton puts it the best when he says, uh, great power tends to corrupt greatly and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And let's face it, if you're a seal, this is the makings of a bad day right here. Power and dominance isn't such a great thing if you're a seal here, right? Well, then maybe, 
quite possibly, this is what's great to you. Mount Rushmore symbolizes a noble task or a noble idea, great ideas. But did you know that this sculpture was initially meant to be a tourist attraction? The guy actually said, man, there is no reason to go to South Dakota. So we need to make something so that people will visit South Dakota. And that's why this was originated. And oh, by the way, when it was being done, the politicians, they were going back and forth and saying, you know, we got to make sure there's the right balance of Democrats and Republicans on here because it wouldn't just be right to just throw guys on here. That would be great, would it? And this thing was never even really finished. It was supposed to look like this. But they ran out of money. So they were supposed to go down to their waist. Maybe, just maybe, something like this would be great to you. This is a, an artist rendition of what our border with Mexico is going to look like. <laughs> if, if Donald Trump gets... No, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> no, this, of course, is the Great Wall of China. Uh, this is a feat of a engineering amazement. This thing's like 13,000 miles long, ranges between 8 and 23 feet high. It was erected to help fortify uh, the then Chinese empire against the invading Mongols coming from the north, uh, mostly to protect the emperor, but <laughs> that's why it was made. But the problem with this is that it had the ability to keep people out, but those that wanted to come in, that were fleeing from these Mongol hordes coming, would sometimes get trapped and get slaughtered. And also, by many accounts, a million people lost their lives trying to build this. Let's go a different vein. Maybe this is what you think is great. Cute, cuddly, Great Dane puppies, right? But even cute and cuddly can turn bad. A friend of mine actually had this happen to him. He said the Great Dane did not get the attention that he wanted and decided to eat the couch. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. This has to be great to you, right? Basketball fan, the greatest King James, come on now. By many accounts, the greatest basketball to ever grace the planet. I mean, really? But then, this type of greatness tends to be fickle. Remember this headline? When LeBron left Cleveland, there were a whole lot of Cleveland Cavalier fans that did not think he was very great. So it would seem to me that there are a whole lot of ideas about what is great. <laughs> and... I think that there are a lot of other things that people think, I don't think they're so great after all. <laughs> so what's it mean to be great? You know, I went through this morning and I, I talked to many of you and pointed out things that I find great in your life, and I really do. I think those things that I mentioned this morning are great. But sometimes I think we tend to focus more on what is great in this life as opposed to what God might think is great. So maybe that's the problem. You know, if we are going to focus on being a disciple, maybe we should think more and be more concerned about what God thinks is great. Jesus makes this statement in the text that we just read a few minutes ago, and he says, in, starting in verse 42... Jesus called them together and said, 
You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' response in this instance speaks of something that we have been talking about for a long time. Discipleship and community. If you desire to be great in the kingdom, our actions need to be like that of Christ. Let me say that again. If you truly desire to be great in the kingdom, your actions need to be like that of Christ who was not about self-preservation, but was all about salvation. Consider the few of the great men of faith that were commended by God. You have David, a man who is stated as being a man after God's own heart. God says, this man is great because he will do all my will. Servant. You got Job. God brags about Job when he says, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. And what about John the Baptist, of who is mentioned of him from Jesus, saying of women born, there is none greater. But why is that? Because John steadfastly served the master. He did what he was needing to do at that moment to proclaim Jesus. So if service is the key to greatness, what do you do with the key? If service is the key to greatness, what do you do with the key? In early 19th century Ger Germany, there was a lot of troublesome times going on. The government was in a panic because there was rumors of revolution. There were revolts going on, and to answer that, they decided to institute a draft. And that's what they did. They drafted thousands of young men and pushed them into service, going into various places. In a small German village stood a grand old stone-walled church with ornate carvings in wood and stone, a beautiful stained glass window, and a stately, magnificent pipe organ. The organ was famed throughout the region for its beautiful, rich tone. One day, as the aged caretaker was going through his business, taking care of things, a knock came to the door. And as he went to the great open door and opened it up, a young man was standing there that was dressed in a soldier's uniform. He had a simple request. Please, sir, can I play the organ for just one hour? Of course, the caretaker said, no, son, I'm sorry. You cannot do that. No one is allowed to play our pipe organ except our own organist. The young man continued pleading, saying, Please, 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 sir. I have traveled such a long way. I have but 24-hour leave that my commander has given me. And after that, we are going to go into an area that is the harshest of fighting. And I'm thinking that this may be the last time that I get to play. You okay, take your thought for a moment. Okay. He allowed the young man to come in, closed the door, reached into his pocket, and pulled out a key. An old key. And he handed it to the young man and said, the pipe organ is locked. If you wish to play it, you have to unlock it. So the young man went to the front, unlocked carefully the old pipe organ, 
And with a big smile on his face, he began to play. And the most heavenly music filled the sanctuary. The old man was in awe of what he was hearing. It brought tears to his eyes. It was so beautiful. So finally, he made his way over to a back pew and just sat down to enjoy the impromptu concert that was going on. And don't you know it that one by one, various villagers started showing up. They come to the back of the church and peered in for a moment. And then one by one, taking their hat and coat off, they came in and sat down to just bathe themselves in the beautiful music. True to his word, the young man played for about an hour. And at the end, he closed the, the lid of the keyboard, locked up the cabinet, and when he turned around, the church was filled with people that came to see. Young man, a little embarrassed, walked down front and was handing the key back to the caretaker. And the caretaker all smiled, said, man, young man, that is the most beautiful music these old ears have ever heard. I got to know, what is your name? What is your name? Young man sheepishly just kind of put his head down and he said, Felix, Felix Mendelssohn. Felix Mendelssohn, who by the age of 20 was already a renowned composer across the European continent, a master at playing. He turned and, true to his word, he, he walked away. He headed back to his commander and his unit that was about to be shipped out. And the old man in wonder just kind of watched him as he walked away and he wondered out loud and said, imagine, I was in the presence of the master and I almost didn't give him the key. I almost didn't give him the key. Church, if greatness is brought about by service, service is the key to greatness, who do you give the key to? You give the key to the master. This morning, we are in the presence of the master. And if you would give him the key, your service, he can make unimaginable music in your life, music that would make the world stop Listen and wonder. That's the key to greatness. If you want to be great, serve the master. 